Now that I've covered how you might calculate what sort of decoupling capacitance you might need, let's break it down into bulk and local decoupling capacitance. So let's, let's start first with local decoupling. Local decoupling. And I'll just write down some guidelines here. For local decoupling, if you're operating at 25 megahertz or below, the 0.1 microfarad uh, capacitance near your IC is fine. If you're operating at 250 megahertz, you want to use a little bit smaller capacitance to avoid that self-resonant condition. And if you're operating above 250 megahertz, you might have to use some other more exotic uh, capacitances. Uh, and I'll cover that a little later. Now what about bulk capacitance? Bulk, bulk decoupling. Bulk decoupling. Well, the value of the bulk decoupling capacitor is not crucial, but it needs to be larger than the sum of all of the local capacitors, local decoupling capacitors that it feeds. Uh, it's a little hand wavy, well, more than a little. This is a lot hand wavy, and not particularly analytical. But these are the this is the general framework in which you could, should think about it. Okay, let's scroll down and answer another question about how many capacitors we should have. Actually, I'm going to start a new sheet. Let's answer the question about how, ma how many decoupling capacitors do we need in our system. And to answer this question, we really need to consider the non-ideal capacitor. Let me draw a circuit. Here I've drawn a decoupling circuit where we have the bulk decoupling capacitor and the local decoupling capacitor near the load. And we have, uh, let's say we're using the same package size for both. So maybe we're using 0805 surface mount technology packages. So this inductance, this equivalent series inductance, let's call it L alpha. That's dependent on package size, so that's going to be the same for both. And let's say over here we have C1 and over here we have C2, where C2 is much, let me write that, C2 is much smaller than C1. What would the impedance look like for the system going from plus 5 volts to, to ground? Let me draw that. Now what if we were just talking about C1? Let's not consider this guy over here, let's just consider C1. This response is going to look something like this. It comes down, 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 down. It hits a trough at some point, which is the resonant frequency for that circuit, that, that LC circuit here, the series LC circuit. And then it comes back up like that. So that's C1. Now let's say we are just looking at C2. C2 is a smaller capacitor, so it's going to look something more like this. I'm drawing this pretty arbitrarily, but this is about what it'll look like. It'll look something like that. Now if we were to overlay those responses or solve the algebra for the, 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 the systems inside of it, what would the composite look like? And I'm just roughly drawing it here. I'm not sure if this is exactly how it would look, but it would look something, let me, let me get a wider pen here. It would look something like this. It would come down, follow this guy, and then it would come up. There would be a peak, which may be a very sharp peak, and then it would come down and then follow that back up like this. This peak here, is called the anti-resonance peak, anti-resonance peak. And this is, could potentially be a problem because for that frequency where this circuit over here effectively looks like an inductor, this circuit over here looks like a capacitor. So what you have is on the one side, you're operating above the frequency where this capacitor looks like a capacitor, and you're seeing the parasitic inductance. And on the other side, for C, this is the part, this is C2, this is a parallel resonant circuit. So at some frequency, it's going to look like it has an infinite impedance. And this is plus 5 volts, and this is ground. And so any ripple up here from loads off on the side is not going to be, it's not going to be shunted to ground. So you have an anti-resonance peak. And if that anti-resonance peak falls on or near some sort of frequency that's commonly used in your circuit, you, you, you've in fact made things a lot worse by including your decoupling capacitors, by, by including two different sizes of decoupling capacitors. If you had picked just one or the other, you would have been much better off. But 
you, you, you are going to see that as anti-resonance peak, and it's something that we're going to live with, and I'm going to walk through that. But before I do that, let's consider the situation where we're adding in more capacitors to the system. Let's say that over here at C1, we were to include a second capacitor right there. So as the value of C1 and L alpha. What would our profile of C1 look like? Well, it would shift because we're adding these capacitors in parallel. We've increased the capacitance, and so this is going to shift down. And we want it to shift down. That's a good thing. It's going to hit its trough at the same point and then come back up. But it's shifted from here down, and that's good. We want this inductance to be as low as possible. So if we were to draw a rule from that, we should say that for any given size, we should use as many of that kind of capacitor, that size capacitor, as the circuit will allow, because you're just going to get a better and better response as this curve shifts down. Another thing to note is that in this plot, we have two dips, two resonant dips, one here and one here. And that's generally a good thing, because at those frequencies, there's very little impedance between the, uh, the, the voltage supply and ground. So all of our, our uh, noise is going to be shunted to ground. That's a good thing. Let me scroll down and write two rules we can say now. One and two. First, we can say, for a given capacitance, we should use as many of those components as possible. So we push this curve down, down, down. And, and this too, too. We should use many of the C2s to push that curve down, down, down. Second, don't use more than two values of a capacitor. So here we have C1 and C2. You never want to have a C3, a C4, a C5, anything more than two. I don't think you should have more than two. And the reason is this anti-resonance peak. You can live with one as long as it's at a low enough frequency, which is usually the case if C1 is on the order of 10 microfarads and C2 is on the order of 0.1 microfarads. That anti-resonance peak is going to be low enough that it's not really going to affect your circuit or most circuits. Uh, but you don't want to include a C3, a C4, because you're going to have more spikes, more anti-resonance peaks, and you're playing with fire. One of those could land on, a, on, a, on a, a frequency that you need to use in your circuit, and then you've made the problem a lot worse by including multiple values of capacitors. Now, as you can see from this plot, C2, I just want to, I've said it before, but I want to reemphasize it. C2 comes down as, because it's a non-ideal capacitor, and then you hit some resonance, and then after that it looks inductive. And you want to make sure that the C2 that you're putting right next to your IC, you want to make sure that you're operating below that frequency, below that resonance frequency. Otherwise it starts to lose its effectiveness. Now we've covered what size of capacitor to use and how many you should use. And let me, before I answer where should they be placed, I'm going to go into a side discussion about modeling. Now, if you're operating at a high enough frequency, you can't necessarily trust the models of the capacitors that you're given in the data sheets. Uh, and you may need to, well, that's not the only thing you should be using. You may need to include models of the printed circuit board. And for instance, you may want to include models of vias or transmission, or transmission lines or the impedance of planes, impedance of planes, etc. I think those are the major things. So you would have your ESL, ESR, the capacity, e, keep forgetting that, ESR, the value of your capacitance, you assign some inductance to vias, uh, maybe an impedance of some kind, transmission lines, impedance of planes, and anything else you want to throw in. But if you were to just use these, I think you're pretty much okay. And you would compile all that together and then put it into SPICE, which is a circuit simulator. You would model the vias as an inductor, maybe the transmission lines as a RLC unit, a, a per unit length inductance, per unit length capacitance, per unit length resistance. And then you would run that simulation and get your system response. You definitely don't need to do this for all designs, not by a long shot. It's not required, but for very high frequency designs like greater than 250 megahertz, you may want to think about going to this level of detail. Finally, let's answer the question of where to put these decoupling capacitors. Let me scroll down and 
and do that. Where should we put these decoupling capacitors relative to the power supply in our ICs? Well, the short answer is that you want to put them within an electrically short distance of the component that they're supposed to help. We want to put them within an electrically short distance of the component they're supposed to help. So if you had a, a load here, physically, I mean put it within some distance of that load. That capacitor should be within some distance of that load. What do we mean by electrically short? Well, we mean that that distance should be less than the wavelength of interest divided by about 10. Some people say 20, let's just say 10 here. And where am I getting this wavelength, this distance? What does this all mean? Well, it fundamentally comes from the equation the speed of light equals the frequency times the wavelength. So for instance, a one, if this was three times 10 to the eighth meters per second in vacuum and we're operating at one megahertz, then, and there's lambda in meters, we would solve for lambda equals three times 10 to the eighth divided by 10 to the sixth equals 300 meters. And so as long as you're putting your capacitor 300 meters divided by 10 or 30 meters from your IC, which is always going to be the case in, an, in a printed circuit board, uh, you're okay as long as you're putting it there. Within that distance, it's, you, can, you can model it as a DC circuit for the most part. Now let's walk through a little more realistic example. We're not operating in vacuum, we're operating in the printed circuit board where the dielectric material is often FR4. So the dielectric constant of FR4 is about 4.5. And so we can say that the speed of light in FR4 is about equal to the speed of light in vacuum divided by the square root of 4.5 approximately, which is about, let's just call it ballpark, 0 0.5 times the speed of light in a vacuum. Let me scroll down. Our frequency of operation is about going to be equal to 1 over 3 times the rise time. And let's say our rise time, or let's say our circuit is, is what, do, what do I want? So it's operating at about 10 megahertz or let's say about a one, let me redraw that. Let's say we have a one microsecond period and a one nanosecond rise time. Well, we care about that one nanosecond rise time because we're dealing with the fast components now because that's gonna give us our more stringent requirement for the placement of the capacitors. And that one nanosecond, if we were to calculate the frequency here is one divided by three times 10 to the minus ninth seconds. This is the 10 nanoseconds, this is that three. It's going to be about 1 gigahertz divided by 3, or approximately equal to 333 megahertz. Now let's go through and calculate the wavelength associated with this. We have 0 0.5 times the speed of light in the numerator, and we have the frequency, 333 megahertz in the denominator, and this comes out to be 0 0.5 meters. You can work through the math and convince yourself. So lambda over 10 is equal to 0 0.05 meters or instead uh, equal to 5 centimeters. Now that means you want to put your decoupling capacitors, your local ones, within 5 centimeters of your integrated circuit. And that's the distance that you might have to worry about when you're, when you're working through your system. Now how many capacitors should you use locally? Well, you should use at least two local decoupling capacitors per integrated circuit. Capacitors, ceramic capacitors, are very cheap, very, very, very cheap, so why not use a lot? And so let's say you had a dip package that's coming out like this. You would put one here and maybe one down here, one on opposite sides of the package. As packages get larger and draw more current, you need to use larger capacitors. One final note, how should you lay out the vias to connect to the capacitor? Let's say this is the footprint, and over here we have five volts and over here we have ground. We want to put vias. Well, the ideal is to put one there, one there, one there, three on this side, and three on this side. Other solutions will definitely work, but this is the ideal solution and the one you should move towards.